Today I want to talk about the subject matter, the preaching of the cross. In the, Old, in the New Testament, the preaching of the cross and the preaching of the gospel are one and the same. Uh, Paul says that I preach Christ crucified. He said that I preach the cross. Uh, the cross is the gospel. When you read in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verses 1 through 11 there, it tells us exactly what the gospel is. Uh, it tells us the gospel is all about the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, those who believe on him and trust in that work, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus, those who trust in that accomplishment that they are saved. That's the gospel. Not because of any works, not because of any, any goodness that flows out of that. It's just simply we are saved because of the finished work of Christ. There are many groups and sects that are out there that will tell you that the cross is elementary. The cross is too basic. Uh, that there are certain other doctrines that are more advanced. There are other doctrines that are out, out there that are deeper. Uh, there are other doctrines that, that, that are out there that are that's present truth. It's, it's good that people are preaching the cross, but they're not preaching the real truth or, or the real message by just emphasizing the cross. But did you know that it is that mentality that Paul uh, preached against, uh, that he condemned uh, even during his time? He tells us in 1 Corinthians 1.18, talking about the Greeks and the Jews, he said, the Jews seek for signs, the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. He says, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But to those of us who believe, it is the power of God. You can't get any more advanced than that. The preaching of the cross is the power of God. You are, there are those who will tell you that, no, the preaching of the cross, that's just a starting point. But I submit to you that today that the cross is the beginning, the middle, and the ending. That's what the gospel is all about. That's what the New Testament was all, is all about. That's what the Old Testament was pointing us to. Uh, but there will be those who will arise who will say, uh, the, the, the preaching of the cross, that's the outer court. You may hear that expression. Or the preaching of the cross, uh, that's the beginning. That's for babes. Uh, but we need to move into a more holier experience. We need to go into a holier place and then into a most holy place uh, with God in order to be able to make it to heaven. Uh, but the cross is good in its context, but that it is not good enough. This is what the Greeks, the Jews, were saying in that day. Those Judaizers, I should say. Those, they were those who... Uh, accepted Christ among the Pharisees, but they believed that the cross was not enough. They believed that uh, believing in Christ for the, your forgiveness of sins and for your salvation and that you are saved the moment you believe and that you trust in what Christ has done, they, t they declared and they went around all through Antioch, they went all through Corinth, they went all through Colossae telling people that the cross was not enough. Yes, Jesus is the Savior, but you, all, you must also follow these rituals, these ceremonies, these laws, uh, in order to stay safe, in order to maintain your salvation. Uh, you must go through uh, these rituals. They did not believe the preaching of the cross was everything. But the Bible tells us, Paul told us that, the preaching of the cross is the power of God. Let me just talk a little bit about the gospel, the good news of the gospel, just for a moment. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 2, 8, it tells us that by grace are we saved through faith. And that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Many can't leave it at that. 
Anytime you speak about grace, they have to say, yes, but. Yes, I understand grace, but you still have to. Dot, dot, dot. But it says, by grace are you saved. That's past tense. And when you believe, you are saved. Paul tells us in Romans 5, he says, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Justified, it has happened. We have peace with God. Uh, then we have 2 Timothy 1.9, which tells us who has saved us and called us with a holy calling. That's past tense, saved us. And had called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which he has given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. So it says he has saved us. Why? According to his grace. He's called us with a holy calling. It's not according to works. He says the same thing in Titus 3, 5. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. There's some who say, well, well when, we, when we have Christ in our lives, we're going to have victory over sin. We're going to be holy. Yes, we will have victory. But we're not saved because we're victorious. We're saved by the grace of God. We're not saved because we're holy. We're saved the moment we believe and accept and embrace the gospel. There are those who say that if you make the gospel too simple, too easy, that it will give people a license to sin. And so what they're saying, in other words, they're saying this unwittingly. They don't mean to say it this way. But what they're saying is, the motivation of living for God should be that potentially somewhere out in the future you could slip up and be lost. And so your motivation of living right is so that you can avoid being lost. So at the same time while you're trying to avoid the license for sin, at the same time, you have embraced a fire escape religion. I'm doing so. Your motivation is 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 that I could potentially be lost. So you're doing good so that you will not be lost. So this is what we call fire escape religion. Just like you have a license to sin, with well, antinomianism, that means people who who are against any uh, good works. On the other hand, you have this fire escape religion that is just as equally as bad. That the only the only motivation is the fact is the is the is the idea or the mindset that you could potentially be lost. Therefore, you will do good because of that. This is not the motivation. The motivation for doing good is that you are you have been saved. It is out of appreciation. It flows out of the Holy Spirit that abides in you, that causes you to do what is good. There are those who say that, uh, yes, we're saved, uh, even though uh, the, the many books that have been written, uh, that say that we well, should never say that you're saved, because that will give people the, the license as they, as they declare. But it's, the, the reality is those same people who try to avoid this so-called license to sin, that they themselves sin. They themselves are lawless. They just have certain rituals that they hold to that make them feel that they're better than other Christians. So there are those who say that, yes, you're saved, but they can't say that you're really saved because they believe that you're really saved when you're sealed. And they believe that the sealing takes place way out down at the end of the world. So you're saved, but it's temporary. It's temporary. In other words, you're saved, now you're on probation until you're sealed. So you're saved, but you're not really saved. You're saved temporarily, and you owe probation. In other words, you have to prove yourself until the day comes when God says, okay, I approve of you, now you're sealed. But the Bible clearly tells us, at the moment we believe, we are already accepted in the beloved. Uh, that those who say that those who receive the seal of God are those who will go through or pass through certain weekly rituals or certain, uh, uh, should I say, 
uh, they attend certain services or, or, or they'll be sealed uh, if they memorize certain doctrines, that's how they're going to be sealed. They've got it in their minds. They're able to stand before courts. That's how they're going to be sealed. But the Bible lets us know clearly that not only are you saved when you accept Christ, but you are sealed. Nowhere in the Bible does it tell us that, that you're sealed because you, you go through certain rit rit weekly rituals. Or you memorize certain scriptures, or you memorize certain doctrines, you memorize certain dates and events and so forth. You are sealed the moment that you trust as the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation. 2 Corinthians 1.22 tells us the Holy Spirit seals us. We, when we accept Christ as our Savior, the Holy Spirit seals us. And this is a down payment, a guarantee that we're going to make it home to be with our God. 2 Corinthians 1.22 tells us the Holy Spirit is the sealing. We're sealed by the Holy Spirit, not by obedience, not minimizing obedience. Obedience flows out of a heart of love, but we're not saved because of that obedience. We're not sealed because of that obedience. 2 Corinthians 1.22 says, Who has sealed us and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. That word earnest means the guarantee. So when we are saved, we are sealed. And we receive the guarantee in our hearts, the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Then in Ephesians 1.13 says, After we believed, we were sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. It doesn't say way down yonder. There's no scripture in all of the Bible when it talks about you being sealed is to talk about something separate and distinct from your salvation the moment you believe. So every time it mentions the sealing, either it's quiet about what it is, or it tells us the only place where it's quiet is Revelation 7. But we see very clearly here that every time it is mentioned, other than that one time, that is talking about the Holy Spirit coming into our lives the moment we believe. So it says, who has sealed us and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Ephesians uh, 4.30 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed under the day of redemption. And, and once again, uh, grieving the Holy Spirit does not mean that you're committed to impartable sin. That is not the case. Grieving the Holy Spirit is just that. It doesn't mean the Holy Spirit is leaving you because you were disobedient or because you failed God and in some area, the Holy Spirit is leaving you and you're going to ultimately commit the unpardonable sin. The Bible doesn't say that. You have people who put this scripture together, that scripture together, and try to break it together to make it say something that it's not saying. He said that you are sealed in Ephesians 4.30 unto the day of redemption. That those who, according to Luke 8 and verse 12, Christ warned us about those who, after they have heard the word of God and believed, that someone else comes along and tries to uproot that word and cause you to be doubtful about your salvation. Luke 8, 12 says that they by the wayside, Luke 8, 12 says, they by the wayside hear the word of God, they receive it with joy. But then comes along the devil who takes the word out of their hearts, lest they believe and be saved. In other words, he uproots out of their lives the joy of salvation. He takes the word out of their hearts. Mark 16, 16 says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And he that believeth not is not saved. You know, you have those out there who believe that if you do bad works, that's why you're going to be lost. Do you know why, you're going to, why people are going to be lost? Let me tell you why they're going to be lost. Because they did not believe on the name of the only begotten Son of God. He tells us that this is the condemnation, that light is coming to the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil, John 1, 19. 